Hi everybody, it's Sheer. Um, today I'm making this video to guide you through and give you a few pointers on the population genetics homework. Uh, before I get started, in case you don't know, if you want to download the homework, you can go to your TA's Elms page, um, and it's going to be under Computer Labs uh, right here. So if you click on that, you can get the link to download the assignment. Um, once you do download the assignment, it's going to look a little something like this. Um, may look a little long and overwhelming, but I promise you it's not at all. It's really fun and interesting, and it's going to be even easier once you watch this video. Um, the lab is divided into two parts. In the first part, you're going to do a few calculations um, using the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equations. Um, that's just to kind of orient you with the mathematics behind population genetics. And in the second really cool part, you're going to actually use an online simulator to look at how population genetics uh, really works over time. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on part one um, because your TAs should have done that in class, but in case you didn't get the full effect, I'll go over it a little briefly. So basically what we're going to be looking at is um, genes that have two and only two alleles. Um, for example, we can say the allele big A and the allele little a. Um, and we can calculate a bunch of different things with those values. We can look at the genotypic frequency of all individuals um, with the big A big A, the homozygous dominant genotype, um, the frequency of the heterozygote genotype, and the frequency of the recessive genotype. And all those, all those mean, all that frequency means is the total individuals with that particular genotype out of the total individuals in the population. So that's pretty easy. Um, you can go further and you can calculate the actual frequency of the big and little allele, of the dominant and recessive allele. Um, and that's what we call P and Q. So if you're familiar with the hardy wardberg equation, that's what P and Q stand for. The amount of big A's out of all of the A's and the amount of little a's out of all of the a's. Um, so if you want a more in-depth review of that, you can read all this information. Um, you can use your book from 106. You can look at chapter 25 in your textbook, or you can do math bench module number six, which you'll have to do anyway, um, and it'll probably help you a lot with this homework. Um, I can do one quick um, practice problem that'll help you with these calculations. If you think you're good, then you can skip this part to part two, um, the simulation, where I'm actually going to go over what the simulation looks like. Um, but just recall, like I said, P is the allelic frequency of big A, Q is the allelic frequency of little a, and we know that P plus Q have to equal one. Um, because if you're not big A, then you're little a, and if you're not little a, then you're big A, and together they add up to 100% of the population. Therefore, using the and or rules of probability that we learned earlier in the semester, we can derive that the genotypic frequency of A of big A big A is P squared, and the genotypic frequency of uh, the homozygous recessive condition is Q squared, um, and the heterozygous frequency is 2PQ. And for the same logic as up here, the three of those add up to one. So just a really, really quick and easy problem just to get you thinking about working with these numbers. If 9% of Africans are born with sickle cell anemia, what is the percentage of heterozygotes in the population? Well, that's really easy. So we know that 9% of Africans are born with sickle cell anemia. So 9% is actually what we would call the genotypic frequency of little a, little a, because 9% of Africans have this genotype. So we're going to say Q squared that should be a lowercase q, but doesn't matter. Q squared equals 0.09. And therefore, I can say that Q equals 0.3. So that's the allelic frequency of little a. And using this equation right here, because I know that P plus Q equals 1, and 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7, I can say that P equals 0.7. So the question is, what is the percentage of heterozygotes in the population? Well, what I'm really looking for, kind of the way I can translate this into mathematical terms, is I'm looking for the genotypic frequency 
of the heterozygote condition. And that's given right here. The genotypic frequency of big A little a is just 2pq. So all I have to do to answer the question is multiply 2 by p by q, which is the same as saying 2 times 0.3 times 0.7. And if you do the math, that ends up being 0.42 or 42%. So that's the answer to our question. Hopefully that kind of got you oriented with these numbers in case you haven't seen them since BSI 106. Um, and now I'm going to move on to the second part of this lab. And again, if you have any questions about this, please come to office hours. You know that the TAs would be happy to help you. So let's look at part two. That's the simulation, my favorite part. Like I said earlier, in this part of the lab, you're actually going to be using a simulator. So you're going to click into this link and uh, let me show you what that looks like. If you click on it, this is what it looked like. And whoa, this looks a little overwhelming. Um, but really, this is very simple. So when you're using the simulation, you have two graphs, as you can see. Both of these graphs graph the frequency of an allele. So we're looking at two alleles here. We're going to call one A1 and one A2. That's just the same as saying big A, little a. So in this graph, you're going to see the frequency of A1 in your population, so from zero to one. And in this graph, you're going to see the frequency of A2 in your population, also from zero to one. Um, you don't necessarily have to look at both graphs because you know that whatever you have here is just going to be one minus whatever you have here. So the graphs are definitely related. Um, in the horizontal axis, we're going to have evolutionary time or the number of generations. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. I'm going to graph it. So let's look at all of these different things that you can modulate up here. Let's start with population size. Population size is fairly self-explanatory. It's just going to be the number of people or organisms in your population. Initial frequency of the A1 allele is where you're going to start um, at the zero point on your horizontal axis with A1. So I can start by saying that a1 is 0.5, meaning that half of the alleles in the population are A1. And because we know that P plus Q equals 1, um, the frequency of A2 is also going to be 0.5. If, for example, I change this to 0.1, I know that I would be starting with the allele frequency of A1 as being 0.1, and therefore the initial allele frequency of A2 would be 0.9. So that's just simple, P plus Q equals 1. The number of populations um, just means that for every, there's going to be several lines on each graph. And um, those are just going to be different populations. And I'll it's, a little, it's a little difficult to visualize, but I'll show you again what that looks like when I graph it. And each one of these populations is going to have the population size that you indicate here. Number of generations is just how many generations you want to graph along the horizontal axis. I think, if I'm not mistaken, for every single one of the experiments described in your lab, that is going to be 100 generations. Fitness describes natural selection. So fitness describes how likely um, the people or the organisms with these genotypes are likely to reproduce. So you have A1A1, homozygous, A1A2 heterozygous, and A2A2 homozygous for the A2 allele. Um, inside each box, you can designate a number from 0 to 1, and this number indicates the fraction of people with this genotype that live to reproduce. For example, if I put 0.5 in here, that just means that um, half of the people with A1A1 reproduce. Either they um, have reproductive difficulties or they die before they are able to reach reproductive age, it doesn't matter. It just means that half of the people with this genotype reproduce. Migration is self-explanatory, but you're not going to be using it in this simulation um, for this particular lab, so I'm not going to go over it. Same with mutation rate. You are going to use bottleneck, though. A bottleneck is just some event that drastically reduces the size of your population, either due to natural disasters or um, 
de for example deforestation and groups um, of organisms die because they don't have a habitat to live in anymore. Um, there are many many things that can be represented by a bottleneck. Um, when you click yes I want a bottleneck, um, it's going to give you start and and bottleneck population. Start just means the generation number that the bottleneck starts. So for example I could say five, which means that everything is happening as usual up until generation five and then the bottleneck occurs. And N just refers to the generation number um, when the bottleneck event ends. Um, so after that there is nothing really um, clamping the population size at a low level. So you can say 10, you can say whatever it tells you to do in the lab. Um, bottleneck population just means the size that the bottleneck reduces your population to. So let's say I have 50 here maybe the bottleneck reduces it to 10 organisms in my population. So that's what those numbers mean, and you'll get to further explore that in the lab. So for right now, I'm going to just show you what a regular graph looks like and how to interpret it. So for the purposes of validity, let's say population size is 500 organisms in my population. I'm going to have an initial frequency of A1 at 0.5, and inherently I know that means that A2 also starts at 0.5. Let's have 10 populations that are each separated, of course. Let's graph for 100 generations, and let's make fitness equal across all the genotypes, and no bottleneck. So let's see what that looks like. I'm going to press go after I've set all of my parameters, and here we go. So as I said, you can see generations are being graphed across the x-axis. Sometimes it's a little bit slow. Um, so generations are being graphed across the horizontal axis. And across the vertical axis up here I have the frequency of the A1 allele P. And down here I have the frequency of the A2 allele Q. A few things to note as the graph is wrapping up. If I wanted to see the next 100 generations, for example if I'm being asked to find a pattern or if I want to see what happens in the next 100 generations, I would just press continue. Um, and then right over here um, on the vertical axis, it would start at 100 and end at 200. Um, for some reason, for A1, I can see one line for each of my 10 populations. And for my A2, I can only see five of the populations. That's irrelevant because, like I said, these graphs are related to each other mathematically. So you don't really, really need to look at what's happening in A2. Okay, so what do I have here? How can I interpret what I'm looking at? Well, basically, some of the popul- well, we're all starting at 0.5 for P. Some of the populations um, increase in their value of P, as you can see in this green population and red population. Some of them overall decrease from the initial frequency, like this bright green and this kind of magenta-looking population. And some of them remain the same. Um, if it were up to me to analyze this graph, I would say that the frequency of P overall is remaining relatively constant. Um, an equal number of populations increase in P as the ones that decrease. A lot of the populations start out, like this yellow population, increasing, and then they come back down and decrease. And overall, there's an even spread. There's no drastic increase in P or decrease in P. And I would say that the reason for that is um, that, well, there are many reasons. I have a large population size, so I know that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is probably taking hold here. Um, I have um, an equal number of fitness for all of my genotypes, so nothing is being selected for or against. There's no kind of, there's nothing driving A1 to be selected for or against. Um, and everything kind of is as usual in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So P is going to stay relatively constant. Um, and that's how I would interpret that graph. Let me counter this. Um, let's see. Let's try a population size of 10 and see what that looks like. Whoa. Okay, so things are looking a lot crazier here. Um, first of all, what am I seeing on the right? I just wanted to do the second graph to orient you with what's going on here. This means right here that 
five of my 10 populations lost A1. What does that mean? It means that it was completely bred out of the population. So the p-value for those populations is now zero, and the only allele present is A2. How crazy is that? Um, likewise, in five of my 10 populations, A1 was fixed, which is just the opposite of loss. It means that for these populations, P is 1, and there is no A2 in the gene pool whatsoever. Um, how would I interpret this? What's happening? Well, I would say that because I have a tiny population size, my populations are uh, a lot more prone to evolutionary... You know, I don't want to give you guys the exact answer, but kind of my guide for you is that they're prone to different evolutionary um, factors that a large population would be. Um, I urge you to look up what that might be, because you may or may not have to answer a question about it. Um, and for that reason, I see a lot greater fluctuation in my graphs. So that is my tutorial for you guys. That's kind of the overview I have to give you. Um, if you have any questions, please email your TA. Please go to office hours. Please look at all of the resources that were outlined up here. Um, you guys have a million and one ways to succeed on this assignment, um, and I believe in you. <laughs> so good luck. I hope that this was helpful, and have a great day.